session uh, in a series of four, whose objective is engaging the youth and private sector in extension, uh, in extension and cultural advisory services. Uh, the, ses the session's objectives are, uh, one, to share experiences on private sector engagement in extension and advisory services, and two, to draw lessons and stimulate extension advisory services through increased effective private sector engagement, and three, to make policy recommendations to inform extension policy agenda to support increased private sector engagement in extension services. This webinar has been organized in partnership by several organizations, the lead organizations being the Africa Forum for Agricultural Advisory Services and the Kenya Forum for Agricultural Advisory Services. Uh, that the, the webinar has attracted participants from the wider East Africa region and also uh, from across the globe. And uh, specifically, we have targeted extension service providers and uh, other diverse agricultural sector stakeholders, including uh, agriculture and farm organizations. We have, we have the gov government ministries and departments on board. We have academia and national research institutions on board. We have agricultural sector non-governmental organizations on board. We have development partners, and we even have uh, youth organizations, among others. For purposes of this webinar, uh, we have arranged to have a two-hour session. Uh, we shall start off with the preliminaries, which is part of what uh, we are doing now. Uh, after, after these preliminaries, we shall have some welcome remarks by representatives from the uh, lead organizing agents. Thereafter, we shall have presentations. We have planned for four presentations, each of 15 minutes. And we are kindly reminding our presenters to strictly try and comply within that time duration. Uh, thereafter, uh, after the presentations, uh, which will last about one hour, we intend to have a question and answer session, and we shall have two avenues for question and answers. One is uh, during the presentations, uh, the participants are encouraged to post their questions to the chat box. And um, if their questions are targeting a specific presenter, kindly indicate so. And after the, the four presentations, we shall have a common session where, uh, presenter, where participants will be invited to ask questions. Presenters will be asked to raise their hands to ask questions, and, uh, and if it's specific to any presenter, to kindly indicate so. We kindly uh, uh, ask those who will be asking questions or those who get an opportunity to ask questions to keep them brief and concise. Thereafter, we shall have a plenary, a panel and a plenary discussion. For the plenary uh, discussion, we shall invite the presenters to respond to a standard question, a common question that is relevant to the theme of the day, uh, which, as we have said, is a private sector engagement in agricultural extension. And thereafter, we shall open, in, open it up for the participants to actually contribute in form of a question or in, in, in form of, a, of, a, of a sharing experiences or, or making remarks. Thereafter, uh, we shall have a summary and resolution sessions where we shall be able to bring out the key highlights and recommendations of this particular session. And thereafter, a closing remarks to, to, to end up our, our webinar. That should take us approximately two hours. Time management is of essence. And therefore, we appeal to all those who will have an opportunity uh, to contribute in this, in this session, either from the participants or from panelists to kindly try and keep them brief and uh, observe time management. So without wasting much time, I want to take this opportunity to invite uh, one, uh, one of the uh, representatives of the lead organizing agencies, uh, that is KEFAS, uh, Mr. Peter Gitaka, to make some remarks and thereafter uh, guide us on the rest of the, 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 the representatives who will make remarks on behalf of the organizers. Welcome, Peter. Thank you very much, George. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are from, everybody. Uh, we are really very happy and pleased to welcome you virtually to Kenya. And I'm sure George has taken us through very clearly on what we expect out of this workshop. Uh, I am the country focal person for KFAS, that is the Forum for Agriculture Advisory Services, Kenya. And uh, Basically, we have a board of management, which is led by Professor Cheminingwa, who was not able to join us today. And as such, I would like to invite uh, one of our board members, Madam Mary Kamau, to give us a welcome address, uh, and then we can be able to get Christine on board. So welcome, Mary Kamau. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mwangi. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, wherever you are. My name is Mary Kamau. I'm a member of GIFRAS. I'm also a member of AFAS, a member of KEFAS. 
and a love of agriculture extension because I worked for that six years in extension. Uh, on behalf of, our, of my chair, KFAS, Professor Chemnimwa, who could not be with us today, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you to this very important forum where we are discussing about the youth and private sector in extension. For sure, extension in agriculture development is the key in innovation and even dissemination of extension technologies that are geared to improving agriculture extension. And for sure, youth is very important as far as uh, extension is concerned because we cannot talk of the future without the youth. And we cannot talk of agriculture extension in the future without talking about the youth. So this is a very important uh, topic and theme for us to discuss today so that we can see how we can get, engage our youth in uh, uh, disseminating technology to the farmers in all our countries, in all our regions. And I'm sure by the end of the day, we shall be able to see how we bring them on board. We cannot talk of bringing you on board without empowering them. We need to empower them, we need to guide them, we need to have policies in place that will encourage you in agriculture extension. And so the same with the private sector, we have to come up with the policies that will bring everybody on, on board so that we can talk in unison that we don't uh, actually uh, operate independently, but we should be able to harmonize ourselves. So I would like to welcome all of you on behalf of uh, uh, AFAS, also on behalf of KEFAS, where we belong. You feel that you are in Kenya today, and we would also like to uh, thank uh, our sponsors, our partners who have made this event uh, very successive. And in particular, Madam Christine, who has always been on board to make sure that we have this event. In Kenya, we have tried to bring you the, uh, on board in agriculture, and especially knowing that ICT is the way to go in extension, and youth are very innovative in extension. We do know that in our region and in Kenya today, there is a lot of penetration of ICT in all the areas as far as mobile uh, usage is concerned. And we do uh, pray that the youth can come on board and use this modern technology to, to do innovation that can reach our farmers. Uh, we had a COVID uh, essay competition on youth innovation. And at this point, I would like to tell you that Kenya won the award and we are supposed to reward uh, the youth who have done that who have done well and we would encourage other countries to bring youth on board along the value chain there are so many uh, areas they can be able to come on board and i'm sure we'll have a better extension in the future and especially use of media access agriculture does videos and all that kind of thing let's look at the homegrown solution in our continent in our countries and move on. Thank you very much and welcome all of you for the, the, this very important event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, <laughs> Madam Mary. Thank you very much. Uh, I can see Dr. Srim has joined us. Dr. Srim, I'm sure you, can, you, you, you can't miss one or two words of welcome also. So Dr. Srim, two minutes and then we go to Christine. So Dr. Srim. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Undi, uh, and everyone else. Um, just a very quick one. Uh, let me thank all the organizers. Uh, it has been this is second uh, second round uh, of this uh, meeting, uh, and it has been well, very well organized. Thank you very much, and uh, all those who have provided some funding for it, uh, the participants, the key speakers. Uh, they have been extremely engaging. And I can quite frankly say that um, it's, uh, the participation has been very inclusive and very wide ranging. 
So I thank you all for that. And uh, let me welcome all of you now uh, for, for this. Uh, a lot of things that I could have said, Mary has talked about it uh, on the issue of private sector and the youth. Uh, but as we know, uh, uh, the private sector really are extremely important in the whole value chain uh, in the agricultural sector, the whole of it. And they are engaged in all of it. So they are, they are, they are indispensable uh, in, in agriculture and more specifically uh, in agricultural extension and advisory services. Their involvement is way, way beyond even advisory services. They are in the, in the, in the, in the funding, in the providing information, knowledge, ICT-based solutions, and so on and so forth. So uh, this, uh, this, this theme of today's meeting is pertinent and very critical. And uh, I think we can take home some of the observations and the presentations that will come along. Uh, specifically on uh, cultural extension and advisory services, uh, we know we have, uh, we have several types of extension and advisory services, especially based on their origin and their purposes. We have the Agambed extension system, as we all know, in all African countries. Uh, we have the NGOs, uh, CBOs, and we have the private sector. Uh, and then, of course, we have farmer-based organizations, uh, which can also double as uh, private sector. And uh, it is pertinent and very vital that the private sector, uh, together with, uh, with, uh, with all the other players in extension, work together. Uh, because uh, you might find yourself working in the same, same environment with everybody else, but pulling different in different directions, and it won't work. So uh, this theme is extremely important. Uh, in one, uh, highlighting what they are doing, uh, and two, uh, gaining from what they are doing, and three, learning, learning from what they are doing, but also if you can uh, attempt through the current country forum, which is beginning to do now, uh, to bring them together, to learn together, and uh, the country forum provide that forum that can uh, be very, very big uh, uh, platform in which uh, collective action can be brought to play uh, for the benefit of all the farmers we have, small and big, and in which these farmers can actually now join and benefit uh, the value chain, uh, can benefit from the value chain, uh, from the commercialization, and improve on their livelihood. So, uh, <clears throat> Without spending a lot of time, again, let me welcome you and thank you very much. So, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Srim, uh, for your words of advice. Uh, let me now take this opportunity to invite Christine. Two minutes so that we can go to presentations. Christine Davis, welcome. Thanks, Peter. I'm Jumbo Wote. I'm uh, Kristen Davis, uh, the co-director of the Feed the Future Developing Local Extension Capacity Project that is co-sponsoring this um, webinar series. And we're thrilled to be partnering with Athos and Kefos and the others. I will even just take less than a minute to welcome everybody uh, on behalf of DLEC um, and to say hi to all of you and just to let you know that we're thrilled to be joined today by these four speakers. We have two from Kenya, we have one from Uganda and one from Tanzania. And we'll be hearing more about private sector uh, extension and advisory services. So I'm looking forward to exchanging with all of you, chatting, answering and, and discussing in the chat box and the Q&A. So thanks Peter and welcome everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. So over to George. So you can proceed with the program. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, now we can go straight to the presentations. And uh, our first presenter is a uh, is a uh, um, Dr. Razin Onyango Odede. Yeah, yeah, he is. Yeah, I've, I've seen him. Uh, Odede is a uh, technical director in charge of operations at Sidai Kenya. Today, Kenya is a Kenyan company that supplies quality livestock and crop inputs and training to farmers and pastoralists across the country. He has a wealth of experience in livestock extension, sales and marketing, 
uh, in uh, animal nutrition and health products, and he's in charge of coordinating extension and farmer training uh, to transform our farmers to profitable livestock farmers. His topic will be on linking farmers to quality inputs and advisory, and uh, we wish to give him uh, his, his next few 15 minutes or so to actually share with us his experiences in this particular field. Welcome, uh, Dr. Odede. Please share your screen. Thank you all. Um, Dr. Ocheng Odede, not Onyang Odede. Yes, so as welcome all, uh, I would like to share with the audience our experience as Sidai in playing in this uh, field commercially to offer advice to farmers while supplying them with inputs to enable them implement the good practices that would enable them to derive value from the use of inputs. So going direct to it is uh, as part of looking at how we engage the youth and private sector in agricultural extension. So I'll take you briefly to what SIDAI is and what we stand for. So SIDAI is a vertically integrated company that was established in the year 2010. We started the running our operations in late 2011 and our aim is to supply quality livestock and crop inputs and provide training through dedicated team of qualified and competent personnel. And this training is delivered to the last mile. Our typical training is done at the farm level where we call farmers in groups at the village level. So our aim is to enable every small scale farmer and pastoralist in Kenya to produce food in a predictable and profitable way. Predictability means how do we advise farmers to get into farming practices which are suitable for their locations? And the profitability is how do we ensure that the output outweighs inputs? And the aim of all this is to ensure that at the end of the day, working with all the stakeholders with the like minds, we have capable and well-equipped farmers who are accessing professional services to improve their yields. And improved yields means the household income will be improved and the quality of life is improved. So we are focusing on animal nutrition, crop inputs, veterinary medicines, and veterinary services. So as an innovative company that targets to get last mile input distribution. Oh, and then, then. Yes? Yeah, can I please ask you to put your presentation in a slide mode? Slide, slide mode. mode. Yes, I will do that. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting. Okay. It's coming up. Are we okay now? No, not yet. Not yet. You're still back to the same position. Is it okay now? Are you okay now? My side is on slide mode. Yes, it is. Yeah, but it's okay it now. Is it's okay, please go ahead. Just yes. go ahead. Yes. Yeah. So what we focus on is uh, identifying that vaccination, nutrition, and hygiene are the coordinates of a successful farming enterprise. We are driving the need for farmers to routinely adopt vaccination of their livestock, look at feeding well their animals, and how do they keep the environment clean to avoid diseases. And this enables them, when they get the, the full range of quality assured products, to get the results that they are looking for. But we back up this with regular farmer and professional training, which is normally done on farm or close to the farms. And we've seen an improvement in the trust level that farmers have in the brands because of the output they have. And we recently had a survey done by Acumen, which gave us a 90% net promoter score. So these are the things that we should focus as an industry. How do we encourage our farmers to vaccinate animals routinely, feed them well, keep them in a clean environment, then they lower the cost of inputs related to poor practices, which make them in car losses. When farmers make money, then we'll also have money. 
So what we've managed to achieve over the last eight years, we've managed to be looking at over 300,000 regular customers and working in partnership with over 2,500 stockists and with over 25 uh, CDI branded products to complement the range of other products supplied by other input suppliers. An injection of $6 million of commercial capital has come in by private equity investors. And we've vaccinated over 8 million livestock. And this has been done through partnerships and collaborations to leverage on our efforts on the ground for last mile service delivery. So that's a pictorial of what a day in Sidai looks like. We have qualified staff in our shops that advise farmers who come to the shops and then they follow them to the farms to ensure that whatever issues they have is fully identified and the advice given is well taken, is, uh, is relevant to the needs. We do last mile delivery to the farmers homesteads. We also deliver to stockies and to distributors. We have vaccinators who have cold boxes to ensure that the vaccine arrives at the farm when it is viable, because that's the major issue we realize that makes most of the vaccinations do not, not work, then farmers end up not liking it. We do a lot of vaccinations, ECA vaccination, as you can see in the lower bottom of the screen, advising farmers on the value of forage or fodder production, and this is done with farmers in farms, teaching farmers on all the practices and inputs they need and demonstrating correct vaccination procedure. So this is just but among the few things that we could practice to ensure that the farmer buying from us or we interact with make value from uh, the interaction. So that's just a picture of our footprint in Kenya. So we are not covering the entire country, but we currently cover about 32 counties and the coverage is complemented by our extension, last mile extension staff who are on motorcycles to easily access every farmer from every corner of the areas that we cover. So the opportunities we are seeing in the industry is in animal nutrition. Our cows are malnourished and protein sources for our livestock is missing, but there's a lot of crop residues that we can harness. So we can work with our farmers to see how we turn value into this. ICT is a very important aspect in the dissemination of information. Today is a demonstration of the value of ICT in communication dissemination. We are looking at partnering with more people so that information can be found online to help our farmers. Financing and insurance is still a challenge. Most of the financial service providers and insurance are not aligned to the needs of the, the industry. Value chain integration is missing, and this is causing unreliability in market access or price offer. And this is a major hindrance to upscaling the industry. So we should look at who are people who are going to play along the chain so that our producers get value. Animal health and genetics, there's a lot that we, in our view, needs to be done to work with the farmers. How do we advise them to maintain their animals healthy? There's a lot of opportunity that. The genetics, are we going to look at the volume of milk or quality of milk? Is that the chain that we need to look at? Supply chain integrity and sustainability to avoid periods of shortage or variations in quality. Then technology and machinery to, trans to support the value chain integration and the, uh, new, the innovations in animal nutrition and all these other things in the value chain integrity. And that complements the agro processing and trade because it adds value when farmers are able to get their products to processors who add value. And when they add value, they'll be looking for specific quality which they will be able to pay for and the farmers will have reliability and uh, better pay from where they sell to. And we have been able to work through partnerships, and this is through local and international partners supplying inputs, and some supply, some who are also transferring the knowledge that they have, which we've been able to disseminate to the farmers and the industry. Then last mile product and service delivery, 
This we've done and we've had some partnerships uh, with uh, BM, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, USAID, among many others, Concern Worldwide, ILRI, and we've had a lot of that happening. ECF vaccine distribution and delivery. We are happy to see that this vaccine, which is very much of value to the livestock, is taking effect because of the collaborative work we've done with the the Director of Veterinary Services, GALMED, ILRI, and other uh, part, part collaborators. We've been able to promote that along the farm and the value of ECF is being seen by the farmers who practice it because the animals are protected against the ECF, which is a major killer of improved breeds and calves of all the species, both local and imported. Newcastle vaccination is something we did and it was done on a village, a more, a village farmer group model where we were this training farmers at their farms and demonstrating to them how to do proper new cast of vaccination. And we are happy to see that in the areas where we did it around Eldoret, Kericho and part of Narok, the farmers are still continuing to do it commercially, which is the aim of a, a sustainable vaccination uh, program farmers should be able to go look for the vaccine or go look for the vaccinators. Then we did some efficacy trials for the ECF new batch of vaccine from Malawi, which is currently being used. And part of it was also some farmer training which was done. And, and the, we've been looking at in the northern part of Kenya, water point interventions, since the areas is vast for those who know it. And the easier areas to interact with the pastoralists and their livestock is around watering points. We've done some work on that with ILRI. We've done it with the USAID, and we've also done it on our own. And it's an area that one should consider if you want to interact with the pastoralists and be able to examine their animals without having to travel long distances or disrupt their herding pattern. And we have been looking at innovate, innovations in diagnostics. We attempted to look at a simple kit for detecting caprine pleuronymonia and the, the contagious bovine pleuronymonia. We did not get the outcome that we are looking for, but what we established that CCPP is a big problem and we should all focus on how we encourage vaccination of the goats because the goat population is dwindling among the affected pastoral communities and those are some of the things we've been looking at part of the innovate, innovation in nutrition we attempted to look at how do we improve the crop residue the maize tovers and using ammonia uh, uh, ammonianization but we the outcome was not so promising but it also made us learn a few things that those of us who are in this meeting and to be keen to progress how we get value from all the crop residues we have into a nutritious meal for most of the cattle being in the pastoral and even in the dairy areas would be a great thing to be done. So in observance of time, I beg to pause it at that and maybe we can engage more at question time. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Odede. I think that was a, a pretty good presentation and very good time management. Thank you. Uh, I want to encourage the participants to continue posting questions to the chat box. And I think it may also be useful actually to introduce yourself in that chat box for purposes of uh, 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 linking up and uh, connecting even after this particular event. So our next uh, presenter, uh, we are going to introduce our next presenter. We'll ask Dr. Odede to exit from sharing uh, the screen that we can introduce our next presenter. Uh, from the timetable, we are going to skip uh, Jahel, who, will not, who uh, unfortunately has not been able to join us yet. And we shall move straight on to Josephine. Uh, and Josephine uh, will, will, be, will be sharing with us, uh, Josephine will be sharing with us uh, her experience from Uganda. Uh, Josephine is the founder and CEO of uh, an organization calling, called Building Rural Incomes Through Entrepreneurship, Britain. She's a seasoned value chain and agricultural market development specialist with vast experience in supporting businesses, SMEs, and farm organizations in business growth and stability. Uh, Britain has been involved in uh, designing and supporting 
uh, at the, and development of projects and institutions handling over $15 million in economic growth projects. So that tells you she really has hands-on experience that can actually, uh, we can actually pick valuable uh, points from her on how we can actually transform our flagging our, or our, our uh, emerging SME in, East, in the East African region. So I'll ask Josephine to prepare to share her slide and uh, proceed on with her presentation. Again, please note the 15 minutes time limit so that we are able to, to live within uh, that time limit. So Josephine, the floor is yours. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. You can hear me well? Yes, yes, yes we, we can. can. All right, then. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'll be looking at linking farmers to markets and I'm looking at uh, basically integrating farmers into value chains. And, uh, oops, why is it, sorry, the slides are, nah. Sorry, let me stop share one minute and uh, share again. It's very wrong. Right, uh, here we are. I think because I've put slides, they are not moving. Uh, try, try your arrow, your right arrow. I, I am. Uh -huh. It's dinging. Uh, just one minute. <laughs> let me stop. <laughs> let, me, let me actually just stop this. Okay, great. Let me share again. My apologies. I know I'm taking time, but I'll not, I talk very fast. So you shall all get to hear something good. Is that okay? Does that, uh, is that okay as a slideshow? Right. Um, so I will be talking just about us and I won't talk much because I think everybody will get the slides. Uh, as you had building rural incomes through entrepreneurship, we are a non-profit organization. Uh, we were set up in 2011 to help accelerate agriculture transformation in Tanzania uh, through agriculture development initiatives. Um, we are designed to facilitate market access, uh, enhance agribusiness competitiveness, increase productivity, and improve access to inputs and finance uh, for value chain actors. So we work on bringing about a paradigm shift among smallholder farmers. We believe smallholder farmers are actually entrepreneurs in their private sector. And so we get, we start with them and we have them conceiving their livelihoods as going beyond providing for the family subsistence needs and moving into a business minded frame frame of mind and that harnesses their competitive advantage. And of course our approach is understanding the market system, understanding how to bring about, what, what, what will bring about a large scale systemic change by addressing the underlying causes with a commitment to sustainability. Um, very quickly, uh, we are in the, currently working in the Southern Highlands of Tanzania and uh, those are the total number of farmers we are working with. Uh, we are targeting 240, Thousand farmers. We basically reach them through AMCOs, CBOs, uh, through developing the input distribution system and working with other partners. Okay. Uh, when we talk about market systems, and as you heard from the previous speaker, uh, the, the market is quite, currently quite unstructured. And one of the things that we do is use market systems development. If you look at the value chain, we develop, uh, we, we said we actually develop. Uh, what do you call this? Uh, you work, we work on uh, developing the input uh, distribution system. Uh, I'll go, as I, as I go forward, you'll realize that you cannot work on inputs without working on, you cannot work on markets without working on inputs. Otherwise, uh, it is counterproductive. When you work on one part of the value chain without working on the other, uh, it creates an imbalance and therefore the system does not have sustainability because it's not interlinked. So we look at extension, uh, we look at working with research institutions. When we talk about extension, we are looking at extension both in inputs and output markets, as we said. We're looking at uh, linkages to financial services, legal services, and BDS pro service provision in terms of business management skills, uh, transportation and mechanization in terms of linkages to um, service providers that actually support um, and all, uh, that actually uh, provide uh, mechanization, uh, learning, uh, what do you call this, mechanization products. So we move to our smallholder market access system. So what are we looking at? We look at three, three how do we integrate private sector and farmers? And I, I put this as a simple um, drawing that uh, anyone can 
success is basically what everybody is doing. And you're looking at uh, individual farmers. You're looking at individual farmers, CBOs integrating with AMCOs. And AMCOs are agriculture marketing cooperatives. So we are talking about agriculture marketing cooperatives in Tanzania. We also, the, the, the savings cooperatives also do, um, they do market. They, they actually uh, do output marketing and they get contract forward contracts uh, through because they finance. So what we're talking about is um, under, under the CBOs are able to access input supply, equipment, um, extension, promotion of new technologies through demonstrations, uh, working with input supply companies. And then uh, we are looking at uh, product quality requirements, produce, demand seasonality. How do we get them to upgrade themselves to be able to know these things? And then we also train on aggregation produce, uh, aggregation of produce. Um, how do you bulk up the produce? which means we are looking at farm organization development. Uh, we are looking at um, supporting the farm organizations to be corporates, to be, to be corporates, um, to behave as businesses, and supporting the farmer as an individual using their farm systems to understand their business. And then you're looking at issues of forward contracts, which I'll discuss later. Of course, post harvest equipment. You're looking at warehousing and storage and all that. Then you're looking at uh, bulk selling, diversification of market, and post harvest equipment. And you're talking about top of the supply chain buyers. So what we do is we also work with um, medium and small uh, processes and build them up and into bigger top of the supply value chain. They grow as the farmers grow. And that's just a quick a brief of who we are and what we do. So when we're talking about linking farmers to markets, we're talking about surplus production. We are talking about bulk buying, and we're talking about integration of smallholders into markets. And we're talking about inclusive value chains. These are value chains that ensure that everybody along the value chain gets value. So, uh, and as we go forward, I'll be sharing my experience and lessons on the green value chain and how we are, and this is something we can actually learn and extrapolate into other value chains. And all you need to do is need to tweak it because as we say, one size does not fit all. Even as we, I'm, I'm just giving a general overview of some of the, the, the models that we use, but you'll realize that um, we tweak them as we go along, depending on the culture, depending on the cultural diversity in each area, uh, depending on the buyer culture as well, depending on, on the policy on the ground, the, the government uh, support on the ground. That's how we change up our models, but basically this is how they look like. So I, I won't take you this through the characteristics of smallholder farmers. I think we all know that farmers are, our smallholder farmers are limited access to inputs and finance, as we heard from the first speaker, limited access to knowledge, uh, to, to inputs and knowledge of improved technologies and practices. They have limited knowledge of market requirements, low post-harvest management uh, practices, non-competitive markets. So they have little, limited access to non-competitive to markets. And there's also, they have high price for volatility. And majority of them sell at harvest uh, with limited post-harvest. This is basically crop production. And we're looking at um, high risk and high uncertainty. And majority of these farmers are not in groups. And we are saying that we want to link them to markets. And so I'll just take you through a few of the things. So um, what about our markets? How do they look like? Um, our markets are both formal and informal. And when we talk about formal, we're talking about um, market systems that are working. If you look at the coffee uh, industry, you have the options and systems that are working in some areas may not be working in some areas, but at least Justin, have we lost you? Seems so. Josephine? Josephine? I think she has a technical problem. Okay, well, I just to move on to the next presenter because uh, if she comes back and we are still on time, we can still allow her to finish. Is that agreeable? Yes. 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 Okay. Maybe her colleagues who are online uh, from Brighton can try to see what's up and chat with us. 
Okay, it's unfortunate we didn't get to finish that, but uh, if we still have time, we can. Okay, okay. Yes, Henry? I was saying, I, I don't know whether I had, I can see her colleague, jo, uh, Godfrey Buona. I don't know whether Buona would have been able to continue, but I think maybe now that you, let's go to the next, and then we, we can come back to that. Okay, then, uh, that's okay, then we can move on to the, to the next presenter. Apologies for that. Uh, and and I, I sorry also during the introduction, I mentioned that Josephine was from Uganda. Actually, she was from Tanzania. This time, uh, we can go to Uganda. And uh, we shall be inviting uh, John uh, to walk us through uh, uh, his experience working with smallholders in the village agent model. And uh, John is a lecturer at the McCreary University uh, Business School, Uganda, and a practicing agribusiness and research consultant. Uh, he has a wealth of experience in on agricultural development focusing on smallholder farmers. And as I've mentioned, he will share with us his experience on a village agent model in Uganda. So welcome, John. Uh, the floor is yours. Kindly share your, your presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello, I am trying to get my presentation on. I don't know why my screen is not sharing. Maybe, maybe uh, the presenters, uh, Sylvia and Adrian, maybe you can share on, on behalf of uh, on this. Yes, I can share my screen. Okay. Hello. Josephine is back. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Josephine. Okay. Josephine? Josephine? I think we still have technical challenges there. Technology has. Uh, yes, yes, can you hear me? Josephine? Okay, we'll ask you to hurry through because uh, you're you are actually just embarking on the next presenter. Kindly hurry through the remaining part of your presentation. Can you hear me? Oh, no. I think we'll. No? We still have challenges. Eh? Now, can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you, please. Oh, yeah. You can hear me. Yes, we can. Okay, so I'll just hurry through. So we are talking about coordinated links between farmers, processors, retailers, and traders, and the development of long-term business relationships, and of course, reduce transaction costs. That is what we are talking about when we are talking about linking farmers to market. And these are just pictures. So let me go through to this model, the first one, and it's very quick. Uh, the reason why I say that we never work along, we work along, this is an example of one of the, uh, one of the linkages that we've done. These are three farmer organizations. Uh, we've supported them until where they've reached a point where this particular relationship and business model, business consortium is currently working. As you can see, you have the hub agro dealer in the middle, you have the AMCOs in the middle, and you have signing of forward contracts. Two things normally happen here. You're either getting accessing finance, either for collateral management to be able to buy inputs, or you're actually doing an FDC and, and then supplying. And we're working with uh, a number of, uh, of, of, of buyers. We're working with uh, buyers like Musoma Food, those are local buyers, who actually have access to big contracts like WFP and all that. And then we're working with people like Fantashiru, who both do processing and also do uh, trade. So we find that uh, uh, the processors that we have are medium-sized processors. Uh, they, they, they were small and who've grown into media-sized processors. But farmers in Tanzania also sell to the National Food Reserve Agency. Uh, we've reached a point where we've supported farmers, that they're the first go-to for the government to, to procure. Then they, they no longer, they rarely, in the areas that we've worked, they rarely work, uh, they rarely procure from uh, from traders because they procure directly from farm organizations. As you can see, those are SACOs and AMCOs. And what we do is we link the CBOs, the smaller farm organizations. We have a challenge with your sound. 
quite formalized and then they, as they grow once they grow we then develop um, uh you're still having challenge with my sound yes. hello oh yes. okay you're not a bit clear. Uh, don't. okay now this is a this is, yep. okay right um, so now this, this is one that was the maize value chain. Now this is a bean value chain where you find that the seed systems are not developed very well. So inputs normally passes through the agro dealer, I mean for fertilizer. But if you look at this bean value chain, so that Silverland, who's actually an exporter of bean, but also a seed multiplier, is actually able to access uh, volumes. If you look at that bottom line, that bottom, you see that farmers were able to get, and, and this is just this season, they've been able to, the, the money cash in hand was one something is happening to your sound again it's million dollars expanding this base silverland no longer oh dear can you hear me again yes can you hear me now you're okay but i hope you don't disappear again no, I'm not disappearing. I'm about to finish. So Silverland is a, is a big multinational. So I've just shown you the small ones, and this is a big multinational. Actually, exporting. Justin, again, the same problem. Joseph? Uh, the next model, we're able to develop uh, a system of young people. Uh, can you hear me now? Your yeah, network is really, really fluctuating. Uh, you, you can just sum up even verbally, then I think uh, we can share the presentations later and uh, people can ask okay. questions in the, for clarity in the, in the chat box and later on in the Q&A session. Okay, let me, let me just quickly talk through the, the presentations, yeah? Let me, let me just quickly, you can hear me? Yes. Now? Okay, this one is a, this is SME and youth engagement. Uh, when we talk about the digitalization, we first have to start the process. Just when there's no improvement. Uh, where the, farm, the, the youth are actually doing business. This particular guy, okay, let me, let me just go through quickly. Support services, as you can see, integrated into market systems. Uh, we're talking about volumes. How have we done it? We map out. One size does not fit all. Farmers are organized in collective, local government involvement. Buyers are willing to inspect the goods before farmers deliver. Good host, host service management practices warehouse management, buyer transaction, and testing of different models. Thank you. I hope this is okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, Josephine. It's unfortunate we didn't, we didn't get uh, uh, the last part of our presentation, but yeah. it, was, it looks quite interesting, and I hope we can look at it later uh, at individual level, maybe shared by email. Uh, without wasting much time, we shall move to the, the other presenter. Kindly end your share, sharing your screen so that we can invite the next presenter. John, I hope now you're ready. Yes, I am. And you have tested your slides? They are working well? My slides are working, but I was wondering why my screen was not getting through. But in case it fails, I think if the presentation is there, they can upload. Let me try it one more time. Okay. Justin, kindly exit screen sharing. Unless um, I... Thank you. So, John, over to you. Do you see my screen? No. I think there is Maybe a problem. Sylvia? Maybe Sylvia kindly share John's uh, screen and then he can talk through it. As you, then you, you control the screen or uh, the, the presentation on his behalf. I would appreciate that. Sylvia, are you able to do that? Thank you very much. John? You see the screen now. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, 
I will be talking about the village agent model and a particular experience from Uganda. We could move to the next slide immediately because I think the introductions have already been done. But just to give a brief background, the village agent model is based on the concept of aggregators who are always recruited by the larger buyers, especially the exporters, the industrial buyers, as part of their supply chains. So the thinking is to adopt the village agents as a last mile extension service provider was initially promoted by a number of project initiatives, notably Sesakawa Global 2000, the USAID Commodity Production and Marketing Program, and DFID's New Tech Market Development Program. Traditionally, the village agents are recruited by larger buyers into their supply chains. And the classic village agent model focused more on producing, I mean, produce buyers as the primary goal. And to a limited extent, these village agents could provide support to production by way of extending inputs and occasionally advisory services. Now, the Ministry of Agriculture in Uganda envisages upgrading this model into an integral part of the extension service delivery system by integrating village agents into the extension services. The idea here is that they form a critical link in service delivery because of the relationship they enjoy with the small farmers. So ultimately, there is a general consensus among stakeholders that the village agents can provide the desired last mile. Please keep, you moved back, go back to the other slide. I mean, move forward. Yeah, there's a general consensus that uh, larger buyers or exporters larger buyers or exporters working with village agents can provide uh, some level of extension services. However, the reality at the moment is that they cannot be entirely relied upon to meet the full needs or extension needs of the farmers. But considering the fact that there is a viable capability within the village agent model to deliver this, if we are to realize that real impact, then we should look at developing the more in the extension services by making it an integral function of the buyers and supplier. I mean the buyer supplier chain. Because as long as extension services are not an integral function of supply chain development among buyers, it may not be very effective in relying on the village agents as last mile extension service providers. Now, it's also important to understand that the advantage of village agent arises from the regularity of interaction they have with the farmers. They tend to interact more regularly with the farmers in remote areas, and this makes them well positioned to reach out farmers as the last mile extension delivery uh, agents. But the incentive to do this right now is weak. And oftentimes you find that most of the village agents face a lot of technical challenges. They lack the technical knowledge needed to provide extension services. Even at the basic level of delivering inputs, they still have a challenge. Let's move on. Next slide. So in rethinking the village agent model and extension service delivery and being able to integrate youth it will require us to tweak a number of things. First of all, it begins by understanding that oftentimes the village agents are well integrated with the supply and the buyer supply chains. And at this level, the relationships tend to be more structured, more formal trade relationship exists, and there is less risk in the dealings between the village agents and the traders or buyers at the higher levels of the value chain. On the other hand, when you look at the farmer end, where we expect the extension service consumption to take place, there is a lot of informality in relationships. And this creates a lot of insecurity for the buyers to be able to invest in order to increase capacity for extension service delivery at that level. Because such an investment is not secure. 
the buyers will always sell to anybody. I mean, the farmers will always sell to anybody else. And as a result, the one who has invested in the production tends to lose. So the risk at that level is very high and it makes the incentive to act as last mile extension agents very weak. Now, the most important thing is to bridge the formality gap. And if I can borrow from Joseph Pins, who was talking about market formalization becoming a reality. Until we begin to bridge the formality gap between the trading end and uh, the production end as a, through a, a supply chain integration, it will always be very difficult to create the environment that is conducive for village agents to act as last mile extension workers, which really implies taking an extra responsibility in that direction. Next slide. Next slide, please. So the village agent model, as it is right now, has merit in as far as extension service delivery is concerned. But we cannot expect it to address the agricultural extension staffing shortages. And they will not be able to address those extension challenges without introducing a new staffing need at the village agent level. So the buyers who are working well with the village agents may be required to provide extra capacity at that level by way of staffing in order to introduce the required skills that are needed uh, to deliver the last mile service. So to address that skill gap, more technically competent youth, especially agricultural graduates, should be brought into the structure through a staffing function for delivery of this kind of services. And it is important to focus this by building farm-led extension service because these are more likely to be more responsive to the farmer need than the office-led extension service. A buyer engaging in soya bean is more likely to build a farm-led extension service that is responsible to the needs of soya bean farmers. And that can make the, uh, the relevant, increase the relevance of extension services and therefore the demand side and uptake. Now, it also involves evaluating the government mandate which currently for extension services focuses on planning and delivering the services. But government should then take a back step and focus more on surveillance, facilitating, supporting, and providing the right policy environment to advance demand-led extension service. There's a lot of talk about demand-led extension service, but when you look at the policy environment, it doesn't provide the exact incentive for the farmers and the people who consume the output of the farmers to define the, uh, the extension agenda. So that is critical and it requires the government uh, to redefine its role and mandate in this. Next slide. Next slide, please. Am I on? Hello? Sylvia, next slide, please. Oh, she has oh, exit. Lost out. Don, how far are you from finishing? Looks like I'm able to share now. Good. Are you seeing my slide? Yes, you can see them. Seeing it? Yes. Oh, great. Yeah, how I am not. I am. I am about. Okay, I am please. looking closer to finishing. Okay, please. Uh, try and speak yeah, up. so uh, looking at the model, looking at this simple model for the village agent in extension services and how we can retweak the process to advance it, you notice that they, it evolved to bringing the trading function to get directly involved in extension services. And the trading function can play a very significant role by way of driving the two fundamental aspects of extension, which is supporting technology development, transfer, and adoption process. Now, you'll find that at the trading level on most of the agricultural value chains, the youth are more integrated at that level. And that makes it a very viable approach to integrating youth 
into extension service. more effective no. yes please we got broken okay continue okay uh the government extension service would be more effective if they focus on engaging youth through the trade process and, and that requires that we bridge the gap government can also focus on bridging the gap between research and the trading function because these two can then facilitate the process of development because the buyers will demand particular varieties, will demand particular services, and the research can deliver that, and the youth can be able to provide that service. But for that to work, it means that we need to integrate the trade segment of the value chain, which attracts the youth most, and also integrate elite youth that are increasingly getting interested in agriculture and agro-commodity training as a response to unemployment challenge. Most of the youth are attracted to this because of the unemployment. But what is interesting also to notice, as I shall observe later, is that the majority of people trading in the agro-commodity value chains and those involved in agriculture have not studied agriculture. The graduates and professionals in agriculture are busy doing other jobs and probably offering office level extension. But getting them fully integrated into this value chain process is very vital. So there's a need to put commodity buyers to the front line of developing the village agent model and to integrate youth into extension services through incentives that encourage the creation of jobs along the extensive service process. And that involves the supply chains. So strengthening linkages between markets and trade and research, which will facilitate them to demand technology and drive their research agenda, stimulate innovation to align extension services to supply needs of buyers, and then facilitate integration of farmers into the commodity buyer supply chain, because that is the only process of formalizing, you know, a dealings with the farmers when they become an integral part of the buyer supply chain. Because this strategy will create more formal business relationships between the farmers and the village agent structure. And this can also increase private sector investment in extension. We cannot talk about the village agent model if the private sector is not willing to invest in extension services. So we must create that environment that secures their investment and makes it an integral part of their supply chain development strategy. So in conclusion, I'll say that the village or can you play a significant role in transforming extension service delivery if they can be well integrated into the commodity supply chain? Uh, this is possible if incentives are provided for the private sector to increase investments in this direction through the processes of supply chain development. And one of the strategies to do this, as I alluded to later, is to have more agricultural graduates and related professionals take up active roles in agricultural production and trading value chain. The majority of the people doing this, as I indicated, are not agricultural or related professionals. Most of those qualified are employed in other places or take unrelated jobs that, uh, because they lack employment, for employment. Government extension cannot absorb them. So it calls for a deliberate action to change, first of all, the elite perception about agriculture which dominantly assumes that it's a risky, less pain, and an uncertain venture around which nobody can feed their future or build their career around. But I think the reality is that it's possible, except we have to put the right uh, frame. You know, we have to put in the right framework, policy framework, the right investment framework, the right incentives, so that we have more and more of these young energetic people moving into being major players in the buyer supply chains. Most of our commodity traders are still in what I call the buying philosophy. They have not moved away from buy and go into building long-term relationships, which is a key in supply chain development. So I think briefly that's what I want to say. That's what I, I, uh, I would propose based on the experiences we've had in the village agent model and working with the farmers and the extension systems in Uganda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much for that informative presentation.
uh, kindly exit sharing your screen so that we can move on to the final presenter or the final presentation. I have just been informed that uh, our fourth presenter, who was Jahel Oliver, is not able to join us. Jahel Oliver from Founder CEO Africa. But uh, we shall ask uh, Henry Kenywa of uh, uh, DLEC to walk us through his presentation because he had shared it with us uh, because uh, uh, so that we, ha we have a complete session. I believe uh, we have covered in interesting aspects of extension and I think mechanization and, uh, and extension services is also a critical area in cultural development. So it would be incomplete for us to end the day without listening to this uh, interesting presentation. But unfortunately, uh, the, the, the one who was to present is not able to join us, but I'm told Henry is familiar uh, with the operations of Haru Tractor and therefore he should be able to walk us through this particular presentation. So Henry, over to you. I hope you're able to share the presentation from your side. Yeah, uh, can you, is this uh, visible? Yes, it is, or? it is, it is, it is on. Thank you all, my name is Henry Kenywa. I'm the head of East Africa for Digital Green and therefore I am one of the present, one of the organizers of this. However, our colleague, uh, one of the presenters, uh, Jahel from uh, Hello Tractor had an accident. He told us he just had an accident and therefore not attend. And so I, I'm, I don't work with the head of tractor, but I understand, I know their model. I'll read through the presentation and then any question that will be posed by present, we'll take them and then uh, Jahel has uh, promised that he will answer them uh, later. So the presentation is, is brick uh, ground. I mean, as a tractor, we know it's basically to brick ground, human and equipment infrastructure to transform the last mile agriculture. The, 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 So the, the organizers see what they saw in, in what we, today is like basically they saw the opportunities and challenges uh, in, ex, in uh, private sector engagement in, uh, in extension services. And they, so this is like what when you look at smallholder agriculture in most of Africa, that's like what, what you see. And therefore them said, what is the, how I, why the tracker? And you can see a tractor when it comes to speed of getting things done, is 40, 40 times faster than, uh, you know, faster. So you need like 40 people to actually like get what a tractor will do at the same time. Cost, overall cost end up being about 2.5 uh, times cheaper. And you know the benefits of tractor service to farmers is you're able to plant on time, we have 6% average savings and upward of uh, three times increase in yield. And this is reason, you know, you can see when you, uh, you compare a ripped uh, farm with a non-ripped farm, you, the issue of the, you know, the, how the uniform growth and height, and this can be attributed to the fact of the, the, the way the soil has been reached and therefore uh, the way the soils have been opened, the reaping, how the seeds are able to fall uncovered. And therefore you see the, both farms, they have been able to identify that with a ripped farm, uh, same, you know, similar seed you're able to get a five times metric tons, and this one is about 1.7 to 1.75. That's the tractor, that's the kind of, uh, so what exactly uh, the situation again of tractor in, uh, in Africa, we can see, or in, in the region, in Kenya, you can see if you compare, in comparison, you can see the global average uh, is about uh, uh, tractors per 100 kilometers arable land. Global average is about 200. Kenya, we are at uh, way less than uh, 50, it's actually quite uh, lower than that. Then China, so you can look at that and see, is only, uh, United States of America, that's already above the global average. I think even now is still way, way far we need to get things done. Now, what are, how, so how do we solve this problem? And therefore they saw a solution, so rather an opportunity to solve this problem through um, organizing farmers, uh, then how do you ensure once you minim organize the farmers, what are the also to, the, of minim minimizing fraud in use of tractor and also how we can grow profitability. So this is both, uh, you know, a service that benefits uh, the private sector and also smallholder farmers. So what products do a uh, head tractor have? And therefore for uh, tractor owners, they have, um, you know, a tractor monitoring device that is, uh, is, that is able to be uh, a put it on your tractor and therefore you can follow how it's, uh, it's performing. And uh, because this, I think, over there, they, what was identified as one of the challenges that he does, people investing in tractor, is like you invest in a tractor, a guy picks your tractor, go drives it, even if you are not pretty certain how many acres he's tilled the day, whether he actually did tills or maybe she tilled or not. And therefore, so they provide us a hardware to connect equipment and the head of tractor uh, cloud. And it costs about $110 uh, uh, for that. 
Then there's the management application. This is a software to manage equipment, operation, and farmer bookings. So this is more like uh, this is more like um, an, an Uber. Is it like more like an Uber for trucks? The other system is like who booked the tractor? Where do you get the equipment? How do we get that? Then we have the, their booking application. So again, the software that now farmers can uh, you know so for community-based agents. So they have the agents on the community. They, they can now uh, a farmer can decide to book and say uh, I'm in. I'm in Jombe in Tanzania in this village called whatever. This and you track them using that and you got to get that. Then the other interesting is the enterprise application. So for banks and you got to de-risk the asset lending. You, you know very clearly that um, uh, the first most the challenge with the private sector is access to tractor. And therefore, where they're able to, I and mean, we have seen quite a number of areas where governments have intervened and set up uh, funds to support uh, this, the risking of uh, you know, access to tractor, and therefore banks are able to, uh, smallholder farmers using banks and those kind of arrangements are able to buy tractors that they can be, they can use to provide tractor services to smallhold, to agriculture, to farmers. Then uh, the user journey is how does it, how, how do we get all this? So from the beginning is uh, they identify and sell technology to tractor owner. So this, this they, they identify who, who the tractor, what this, uh, if you're a tractor owner, exist a tractor owner or potential tractor owner. So Hero Tractor is able to identify and sell the technology to you. Then they provide tractor owners with business and technology training in terms of uh, how to, uh, to operate and run that business. Then number three, assign the tractor owner to predetermined route. So this helps so that you don't have too many tractors in one area because they're able to use, uh, uh, you know, data to establish on in one region, how many tractors are there. Therefore, you're able to allocate uh, a route that will be able to make business sense for that tractor owner. Then five is your booking agents, uh, booking agent rates and service quality. So that's now they provide. Then finally, the tractor owner service, uh, services booking. So that now comes, and then they train the agents along the route to book on how to book the tractor. And you can see that is one of, I think when they made a presentation, well, that's, you can see one of the quotes uh, uh, attributed to the president of the Republic of Kenya, uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta, he said, we desperately need this, uh, something like this in Kenya. And I can guarantee you now I, it is in Kenya. And I think you would have said more about that. So um, going forward is like, so the, the idea is like, organize and book tractor services from needing the same, uh, that was on the, uh, the, on the farmer side is organize tractor services for farmers needing same service at the same time in the same vicinity. So if you have farmers in a certain area who require uh, plowing, so that again, you can organize so that when a tractor comes, is able, the route is able, is, is structured in such a way that you will not farm, go back. So it's in the side that it will be able to smooth transition from one farm to the other. So they organize that, they're able to organize that farmer and they have that, that kind of farmers in that manner that make it easier for the tractor owners and the operators <coughs> to go to this farm. Then they ensure that the, the Plots are properly cleared, roadway accessible, plot boundary measured are digitally, and they're digitally recorded in the app. The important of this is because if your farm is not cleared, it, it takes, a lot of, uh, takes a lot of time, lead time that to be used in uh, just uh, tearing land. Again, if the boundaries are not properly marked, you, you run into risk of you know, going into plowing to uh, the neighbor's uh, plot that will not be paid and you know the challenges. So this one from the beginning, the, the agents help ensure that this one is done and it's all digitally recorded. So by the time the tractor is going there, you know that out is 10 acres and start with acre number one of Mr. John goes to Henry Kinua, goes to whoever. So is that very clear that way? Then they organize and manage payments between the tractor owner and the farmers. How do the payment be done? Is it by OM? Is it by mobile money? Is it by R? Is it by, uh, before, farm, before plowing, after? So that kind of arrangement depends on area. You know, is the how tractor is also make, them make that, that linkage and conversation between the two. And then most of the, as you say, they suggest paying 10% booking commission to incentivize your agent so that at least you are pretty certain that if, if a farmer books, so he pays 10%, that, that incentivizes the agents to keep, but also the farmers to uh, not to change their mind when the tractor is already on that road. So that's the company leadership team for Hero Tractor. That's the team that uh, is doing that. Jehel was the one to come uh, and work, uh, you know, present to us. And he's still the, he's actually currently in Kenya. He's in Western Kenya. He's been uh, going on with training. And I think even today when he had an accident, he's still going around there. So that's their team. And uh, that's the basically some of the tractors, how they go about it. And that's it. You see, that was breaking ground. Thank you very much uh, for listening to this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Henry, for stepping in for Jahel. At least uh, we have an, a, a pretty clear picture on exactly what Hello Tractor is all about. We now move on to a question and answer session. 
uh, I, I see a lot of questions have come in the chat box and I believe our panelists are responding to some of them. But uh, I, I've picked a few questions that perhaps we can, we can get the panelists to respond. Uh, and any participant who feels to ask a question, kindly raise your hand, we shall give you a chance. But maybe as we start, uh, the first question I'd like to uh, send it to Josephine. Josephine, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Okay, there are, there are, there are two questions, Josephine. Uh, yes. from, uh, from, I hope I'm getting the pronunciation correct, from Ngusie and, and Jane. Uh, the first question they are they're asking uh, uh, what strategies has Britain come up, Britain come up with uh, for adaptation to the COVID-19 menace? And the second one is, uh, does Britain work with young women entrepreneurs in Kenya? GIZ, okay, that is specific, asked by Jane Toom, GIZ, Etivet would like to work with them. So one question is specific to Kenya, whether you're working with young women entrepreneurs in Kenya, and the other one is on... Um, COVID mitigation measures. Okay, um, thank you very much. And uh, just to state that I am in Tanzania and uh, what we are doing in terms of COVID is we are now looking at issues of uh, digitization. How is it we can actually deliver some of the services we have in terms of training and capacity building? Um, and, and, and that is what we are looking at in terms of digitization. And this is for uh, looking at USSD, is there any way we can deliver messages directly? And also looking at uh, WhatsApp as something that everybody seems to be using in, in, because majority of the areas you find farmers with smartphones. Uh, but in terms of COVID, the only other thing that uh, we are looking at is not gathering in one place. And um, when you work with uh, the village extension, if, if you realize that my last slide, the slide where I was talking about youth and entrepreneurship, is that we have youth in the villages where they're actually supporting the, the extension themselves and providing inputs as incentive. That's the incentive, they're making money from the services. They provide uh, extension and they also aggregate and buy from farmers who are not yet um, in, in farm organizations that are actually doing business. And they're able to provide that service as a, uh, in terms of value and they're able to reach a point where they are going to aggregate. So that's what we're doing with, uh, in terms of COVID and in terms of being able to manage that, because what it means is that because these people are there themselves, they, they are doing social distancing, they understand uh, what they need to do, and uh, because they're village-based, then they don't have to bring people together. So that's one of the things um, that is happening. But uh, so far, you know, in Tanzania, we've continued with business as usual uh, and taking all measures that are supposed to be taken um, in terms of prevention of COVID. In terms of uh, working with young women at agri entrepreneurs, yes, we have young women that we are working with, but in Tanzania. Unfortunately, we are not in Kenya. We would love to be in Kenya, but we are currently in Tanzania. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Odede, are you still with us? Dr. I'm there. Okay, Odede, yes. Uh, two quick questions. I think you alluded to this, but uh, somebody has asked this. Eh? How is the extension delivery model linked to the input access? Uh, that is Catherine. And then we have uh, Ngusi, I hope I'm getting that pronunciation correct, asking whether CDI has analyzed the outcomes of their services at farm level in terms of productivity and prof profitability. I think, have you been able to quantify the impact of your model? That's the second question. Yes, so I, I captured that. And the other one I also captured was our intervention in enhancements of quality based milk trading. So if I start with that, we've been looking much into that. And why we focused into that is the current payment model is called quantity based. So whether the butter fat content for milk is 2.8 or the, the somatic cell count is over 200,000, the payment is the same as whether the good milk, which is below 100,000, a column informing unit. So uh, what we did was we had a partnership. We looked for like-minded processors in the industry and we identified one partner who we currently work with in Embu. It's called Brown's Cheese. We did set up a milk collection point where milk is analyzed on collection. At the onset of milk delivery, we had about 30-40% uh, milk rejection, either the alteration or poor milk quality because of high somatic cell counts. But what we did was to follow up those farmers 
to advise, to find out why they were missing out on the quality specs. The advice was given to them, and those whose animals were giving good milk, but they were interfering with the milk, had to change the tag. And as we can report, there are minimal rejections of milk in that hub. And uh, to add value to that is to ensure that farmers get quality inputs. What has been happening is uh, most of the milk processors pick milk from farmers but pay after 30 or 45 days. So it means farmers are at the mercy of anybody who can offer credit. And most of what is offered on credit that liberally is normally not of good quality. So because they get uh, doubtful quality, then the productivity would be low. But then why do we get involved in extension? For us, the farmer is the employer. And if your employer is not getting value from you, the employee, then you know the company is going to fall. So our role in working with the farmers is to ensure that they get value from what they do so that we can continue earning from the profit that they make from the business. So it is in our understanding that our founder saw that what is missing in our farming system is the understanding of what to do and access to what is needed at affordable cost. So that is what we are trying to do. Get to the farmers, be they farmers who buy from us or not buying from us, because they, 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 if they don't buy from us today, tomorrow they'll buy from us or they buy from somebody else and the industry is basically baking a bigger, a bigger cake so that every player can be able to have a bite. Other than having very few, if you were to focus on only dealing with those who come to us, then it means we'll not grow. And if a farmer we deal with is having the animals protected, but the neighbor is not having the animals protected, there's still a chance that there'll be interference with the kind of uh, good practices they put in place. So we have seen uh, sometimes when the market is not good, we get an oversupply of good quality milk. And the processor we are partnering with is paying a premium price, which is above what other, everybody else is paying. We are looking at expanding that network to other areas. We are targeting around thicker, but we are yet to, to implement it. So if we can get maybe in this meeting or the linkages to the people attending this meeting of any milk processor who is looking to pay for quality, we already have a chiller in place in Thika, which will be happy to partner with that processor to ensure that the farmers get value and they get all the inputs they need in, ex for the, in terms of a check-off system for the milk they deliver. But we try to ensure that whatever milk they deliver, they do not redeem all of it. They retain some that they'll get uh, some earnings at the end of the, the month so that they get, yeah. So that's partly what we are doing. And agriculture is controlling 30% of the GDP according to the recent statistics. But of the production we are getting, the, it's just a fraction of the losses that we get from the death of animals, the failed crops, and oh, part of the question that I'm also answering is our involvement in crops. We realize that farmers get issues with counterfeit products. And counterfeit is so serious that you even have counterfeit seeds, you have counterfeit fertilizers, and you have counterfeit advice. So we've tried to intervene in that space by procuring seeds directly from the reputable seed companies and supplying it through a very controlled chain to the farmers. And the response we got from some farmers is they normally get good germination rates when they buy seeds from us, but they, all the packets are labeled the same. So we know counterfeiting is a global issue. And the other thing that we try to advise farmers is on soil fertility management. Because part of the issue we have is high soil acidity because of this. Please wrap up. So wrap yes, up this, we have this tradition of using a DAP. If you use DAP and you don't keep checking the soil pH, you end up with a very acidic soil which locks up all the nutrients. So this is part of what we've been advising people to take their soil for analysis. And based on that, then a corrective measure is taken. Some of it is just adding lime okay. to the soil. Thank so you very our, much. our training is not charged to farmers because it is a service to the employer who are the farmers to ensure they generate enough income for us to be able to continue being in business.
Th thank you very much. Then a, a quick one to John before we take questions straight from the participants. Uh, uh, somebody wants to know how are the village agents compensated? A quick one. Yeah, presently the village agent <coughs> compensation is not clear. Uh, as I indicated, most of the current initiatives have been project driven and therefore most of their compensation is done by the projects. From the buyer perspective, because buyers are not fully integrated in the extension service process, there is no direct compensation except the volumes that the village agent is able to deliver because the more volumes you deliver, the more likely earnings you're going to get from the buyer. Buyers tend to provide a particular margin to the village agents and therefore turnover becomes a critical factor. So at the moment, as I indicated, there's a weak link, a weak incentive towards that. And therefore, their reliability in delivering extension services is quite poor. But also, on the other hand, you find that there is no certainty, you know, because they are not very sure having invested and done all this to this farmer is not going to side sell or sell to another person. So they tend to limit their engagement to a few farmers that they think are within their usual sphere of control. And that affects them. So compensation is one of the critical factors that must be addressed. Thank you. Maybe you can take At a the few policy questions. level. Thank you. We can take a few questions from uh, the participants. I see Fatuma. Are you Fatuma, are you still there? Your hand is up. I can see Fatuma and Beatrice. Any of them who is ready to, to shoot a question? Yes, Fatuma? Okay, if, if, if no question is coming from uh, the participants, I, I, there's another general question here that, that uh, again is in the, in the chat box, but uh, it's asking, what is the motivation of private sector engagement in extension services. This, this can go to any of the any of the uh, panelists or even anybody from the from the participants. Or if anybody from the participants is ready to ask a question, we are good to go. Beatrice, I can see you. Hello. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, and I want to thank all the organizers for this. Thank you, Delek and Kenya for the organization. Uh, one of the questions I think is answered uh, has been answered somehow you're not hearing me i'm saying introduce yourself please briefly oh just i'm sorry uh -huh. this is beatrice Luzore. i'm the oh. i'm the ceo for the uganda forum for agriculture advisory services which is a country chapter of the afas or africa forum for agriculture advisory services and uh, this is actually a topic of our interest because we are one of the countries which uh, participated in the study for the youth. And as I indicated, the VAM or the village agent model was one of those models which, were, uh, which was studied in Uganda. And that's why I said that yesterday when we had a validation of some of the results, people are saying, it looks like people are making a lot of adjustments of this model. And this is being based on the lessons. And one of the lessons is that um, he is saying that uh, maybe the incentives and all that, but they were saying even with all the incentives, actually it's, it's very difficult to bind uh, the, the VAs to, to you and be working for you. So they actually, once they get experience, some of them, they move on on their own. Uh, someone was telling us about how they have actually handled that uh, using an online, uh, an online uh, I don't know, model, we're asking the person whether that is a new model or it's an improvement on this. And the other thing which I wanted, I was raising my hand on is the issue of mechanization. We find that the challenge we have in Africa, uh, in most of the African countries that, you know, most of the farmers are, are small scale. And then you find that, you know, when you have a tractor or a tractor service in a community, it is, it's more, most of the time it is on the road, it's moving to go and do one acre here, a, a half an acre there and all that. And then the efficiency really goes down. Then another one which I raise is that you find that most of this is plowing. And so the tractor is uh, 
is, is, is only during the season and then the rest of the time, it is not, you know, working because very few people, if, if it's not in institutions, are using the tractors for planting, for weeding, for even transporting, you know, the harvest. So you find it's only just uh, localized on plowing, not even the harrowing, the, you know, the second plowing, it's just the plowing. And most of these, they have plows. They don't have any other implement. I don't know, the person is not there, it is a different person, but I don't know how we are handling that. Because surely, when you, are, you use the tractor like that, the efficiency is so low. Okay. And that is in Africa, and it is very, very, you know, someone made a comment in Uganda that, you know, the saddest thing is that you see a tractor being used on the road, because some of them, they actually now start ferrying uh, things like sun and whatever on the road. But when this tractor breaks down, uh, especially the public tra uh, uh, tractors, when it breaks down, the, 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 the money it has raised cannot even buy one tire. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Beatrice. I think you've gotten your point. Uh, I don't know if anybody can respond to that because, as we said earlier, the expert in that field is not with us. But as we promised, that will will get a reaction, uh, a response by email, and we promise that will happen. Fatuma, yeah, are you still I think... yeah, Fatuma, thank you, you very much. Okay, Excuse be me. very, 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 very brief. Eh? Very uh, brief. I'll be very brief. I don't know ask questions. I'm just concerned about the ordinary farmer. All the models that were uh, presented to us. They're talking about experts, they're talking about traders. But at the end of the day, I just want to know how you, you protect the ordinary, the smallholder farmer from exploitation, so that at the end, end of the day, this person's livelihood can be improved. And finally is the question on COVID. We mm -hmm. are in unusual times. COVID-19 has, has affected all sectors of life. So I just wanted to know how this has affected also agricultural markets and also food security and what mitigating efforts are in place. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Fatuma. Uh, I don't know that we, there are only two hands up. Can we take all the questions and then we can ask the, the panelists or anybody else who wants to respond to this question to do so in the interest of time. Samson, are you still there? Yes, thank you very much. Very, very Can briefly. you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Very okay. briefly. Okay, I'll be brief. Samson Shetu from African Forum for Culture Advisory Services, based in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Uh, so my question is in relation to the village level extension model. So in fact, I dropped my question on the chat box wrongly. So my question is, is there any mechanism to institutionalize this uh, model into the existing public extension system, which is a single spine extension model? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And finally, we have our Abdul Samad Isa. Uh, uh, thank you all. Abdul? Uh, hello? Yes, you have to speak up. We can't hear you. Okay. Oh, I thank the organizers and the presenters for this uh, wonderful presentation. I think my name is Abdul Samad Isa. Uh, I'm the lead extension and research for APS uh, based in Nigeria. So my question was just looking at how much, because um, just like uh, John have uh, presented, how we, are, we will be able to cost, uh, to reduce the cost of implementing trainings for youths, because most of these youths don't have the basic knowledge of agriculture. So when you put them into the supply chains, what happens is that they focus so much on, the, on, uh, on trading, because it brings incentive, just like uh, some of the presenters have made mention. So, in doing that will uh, divert their attention from training the smallholder farmers, which I think one of the presenters, uh, the, the participant also asked question on that, how we will be able to protect the smallholder farmers. Because once there is diversion from, tra from training, they, there are no incentives, especially for us as private extension system, we don't have incentive for training. The only incentive we have is for aggregation, for instance, commodity aggregation and input sales. But we found out that the youth focus more on those things that are being incentivized. So my question would be, how do we manage this disparity? And how do we focus uh, the, the youth on being able to, to train the smallholder farmers? Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much. I, I think uh, in the interest of time, what I would suggest is that uh, as our panelists respond to the panel question that uh, I'm sharing in a, in a moment on the screen, they can integrate the relevant questions to them as, as they respond to this particular question. Thereafter, we can open up for uh, uh, some short comments or reactions from the participants also, uh, if time allows. And straight away, I, I want to share this question. So I will ask uh, our panelists once again, uh, especially the three of them, as uh, starting off with uh, with uh, Josephine. Josephine was the first to go. What we are asking, or what what would like to, to look at now quickly, taking into account the questions that have been asked and uh, from your experiences and lessons, what are the opportunities and challenges for effective private sector engagement in extension service provision, and what are the policy gaps that hinder effective private sector engagement in the field? So again, you can you can you can integrate um, the any of the questions that that has been asked that is relevant to your presentation as you respond to this. Thank you very much, and make it very brief, eh, please, in the interest of time. No problem. Um, uh, is it okay? You go back to the question. Yes, <laughs> sorry. On screen. Thank yes. you. Um, the opportunities uh, for effective private sector engagement is one. Uh, the opportunities are there to ensure that you develop business models. At the minute you're actually engaging private sector, you have to be able to show value. Value to the private sector and value to the farmer in terms of money. And uh, just to talk about that value, I'm talking about the village-based the village based agents. Learning from Uganda and learning from all those other countries that have had them, uh, we integrated the value where they started to do business. The linkages between... Um, bringing value to the agro dealer and telling him that when he works with the village-based agents as part of his extension system, he's able to give them commission because they aggregate demand, aggregate demand for inputs and also for the buyer. So they make commissions. So when we're talking about opportunities, that is one opportunity. The challenge is actually a uh, mindset change, um, getting the, the businesses to understand the value. So you have to break it down to them in a way that they understand. And that's what we were talking about uh, the cultural diversity. How do you present the information? Don't present it how it was presented in Kenya. Don't present it how it was presented in, as uh, Henry said, in Jombe. Present it according to how people view value in that area. That is, those are the challenges that you have in terms of on the ground, um, uh, what do you call this, uh, private sector engagement. Um, because you reach a point where someone tells you, I'm a big buyer, but your, your people are actually talking down on me because they went to school. So you have to find a way to ensure that that doesn't happen as you go forward. Okay. And then in issues of policy gaps, um, in terms of policy, one of the things about, um, the, one of the ways that you can actually engage and have uh, the policy gaps are that uh, the government sometimes does not understand how private sector is working. And of course, they want to be able to set rules and regulations without understanding the whole market system. Um, in the same way, uh, there's definitely no way extension can be done separately from government. You must work with the, with the government system. You must be able to get a common vision with government on the projects that you're implementing, because that is the sustainability that you build and you lead. And those are the people who end up being able to talk on policy level and say, this is working in our area, this is not working in our area. Those are, that is how you're able to address those policy gaps. But the second thing is that where you see um, there's a policy gap, the private sector together with the government, with the local government, because we, I know we have county governments in other countries, for us we have local government and the regional governments, where you, you sit with them and once they understand what you're doing, you're able to put together a policy, um, you're able to have, uh, what do you call this, um, you're able to evidence-based policy. Uh, gaps, identify them, have evidence, do the research together, and put together a policy paper that can actually go forward. So that is what we're talking about, that you, you will be able to address those policy gaps if it's evidence-based and it is engaging. So finally, as uh, on the village, uh, so as I said, government has to be involved. They don't necessarily have to do the extension, but in areas where you haven't reached, if you're able to train build the capacity of the government extension system, then all those new technologies are able to be transferred to other areas. Um, so I think that, that is my basic thing and opportunities and challenges. Thank you, Dr. Odede. Very, very, very briefly, 
very very briefly please yeah so maybe just to uh, 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 allay the fear small older farmer control 80 percent of agricultural productivity in the region where we are in so when we are talking about working with farmers training in them in groups it is a small holder farmer that we are targeting and any training to be enticing to the youth or any person must bring value so if you find the youth are not keen in the kind of training you are offering just look at if you are the person being trained would you transfer that knowledge into money if you cannot transfer it into money then you can bet it nobody will be interested in the training our experience has been farmers get more and more interested when they when they implement what you've trained to them and they see value then they come back to you to ask for more so so the biggest incentive for training is the output that will come from implementing the training so the opportunities in uh, in uh, private sector engagement are are huge because with the structural adjustment program the ability of the public sector to offer extension is diminished so it becomes more of a reality that the private sector need, has a big role to ensure that the farmers are ma making money and we are competitive globally what we will need is a fiscal policy environment that favors business in the agricultural sector and given we have an east african common market if the fiscal policies in the partner countries are not the same then we end up with influx of goods from neighboring countries which kill the local industry in the countries where the tax policies make the cost of goods more expensive so we should look at how do we ensure that the regulatory environment in all the partner countries ensure that if there's vat or 14 percent in kenya it should be the same across states if it is 16 percent in uganda it should be across all states in the absence of that then you end up one country is cheaper and the way forward is private public partnerships the directorate of veterinary services have initiated a ppp protocol for disease control and a lot of this needs to be done because this is what has interfered with disease control strategies being promoted by the private sector when the public sector goes ahead and gives free uh, animal health delivery services which mm -hmm. are not sustained then the farmers end up not doing it the way it is supposed to be done and we still end up with issues which come in okay. it is cheaper to do extension through the private sector because everybody looks at what is the farmer getting what am i getting and what is everybody getting so okay. if we focus more on that then we'll be able to grow the sector okay thank you and finally john and i want to remind the presenters that uh, there are questions in the chat box kindly continue responding to them so that uh, we ensure that every participant's question is responded to john yeah, uh, thank you this. very much uh, and very very, very much very very i share you. i share the views advanced by my colleagues and uh, josephine uh, uh, but i just want to add one thing what is the effective way of getting the private sector to engage in extension service the answer to this question requires to understand the needs of the private sector the buyers particularly are interested in quantity, they are interested in equality, and they are also interested in certainty and consistency. Now, most of the buyers operating in the current environment find themselves in a very hopeless situation because they do not have control over these four critical aspects of their business uh, needs because of the informal process. But if they can guarantee their quantity from day one, the quality from day one, and be certain of what they expect at the end, it increases their ability to manage their business operations, create more value, and uh, will be willing to make investments in this direction. So it is very critical, as I indicated in that earlier model, that the government integrates the buying function into uh, in, into the extension services. Buyers are detached from extension most of the time, and yet they are the people driving uh, the demand, I mean the supplies, the demand side of things. Mm -hmm. And that should translate into extension service demand. But what, because of that disconnect, 
unless we address it both at policy level, and I think uh, Joseph in articulated the issues around the policy gaps, government must engage the private sector, understand their needs, and then create the environment, the policy environment conducive to support their investment into creating certainty in their business operations in the small market. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody from the audience who wants to make a comment on that question? A contribution from the, from the participants? Yes, we are giving an opportunity to anybody from the participants who wants to make a comment on that issue. Opportunities, challenges, and policy gaps. Yes, Mary Kamau. Mary, I can see your hand up. Mary, please unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead now. Yeah, uh, I would like to say that uh, in every situation and in every country, if we have to bring on board the private sector, we have to have uh, policies that uh, bring this harmonization together with the government. Because you cannot do a policy, and especially in extension, we did one in Kenya, and we had to bring everybody on board when you are doing the policy, so that we can take care of the concerns which have been uh, put forward as far as the, the private sector is concerned. Because if it is the buyers, definitely they will need the quantity, the mass, the, the mass, the mass, I mean the the supply, the consistency, the supply and all that. And even in the pricing of the commodity. So I think in policy guidelines, where we have uh, policies uh, to guide the extension, we have to do it when we bring everybody on board. Because what we are saying is harmonizing each other, such that whoever is providing extension in any country or in the region is harmonized, and they know what each other person is doing, and they know the requirement of each other, of each other so that they can be able to, to work together. But if we have so many providers out there, maybe the government out there who do, don't know maybe what each one of us is doing, I think we may not achieve much, but I would think that if we can be harmonized as extension providers, or um, uh, I mean, um, for, I mean the the activity providers for the farmers, we need to harmonize. Let's not work in isolation. Let's not work in silos, but let's work together and work together so that we can have the the impact. I think the government cannot do it all. And that's why we have now brought uh, maybe um, other providers in the extension, CBOs, private sector, the youth. We have to work together in one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary, for that uh, uh, comment. Now I think according to our program, as we approach the tail end of our webinar, uh, we want to share some summary and resolutions from the presentations today. And uh, we had we have planned for uh, Professor Maina to lead us or to take us through the resolutions and the summaries. I hope Professor Maina, you are with us. Uh, yes, I am, George. Good okay. afternoon and uh, greetings to everyone who is listening. So I can take this time to give the summary, George? Yes, yes, and be very, very brief also. Time is not on our side. Okay, so uh, this is just a quick recap of our uh, presentations today. We have had four very good presentations, one from Dr. Odede in Sidai on linking farmers to quality inputs. I just want to pick a few key um, contributions that farmers want to do their business in. Hello, Professor? It's a very key thing is to work with the farming community. And I want to say this last mile concept really has fit.
Hello, is it my so network or everybody else is getting professor? Is everybody no, else getting? No, he's cutting. He's breaking. He's breaking. breaking. Professor Maina, you are breaking. Professor Maina, are you still with us? Professor Maina? There's still one hand raised in case we can take that one. Yeah. Maybe George, as we wait for Professor, you can maybe the question from me, uh, from me. From? Mommy. from? Is somebody who is raised the hand, maybe Mohammed, Mohammed, okay, he can go ahead. Mohammed, thank you. Mohammed, your hand is up. I did mute it. Mohammed, you have muted. Can you unmute? Okay, go ahead. George, can I resume all this? Some other part, another person? Okay, we were inviting a question as because we lost okay. you, I think you dropped it, eh? but he's also gone mute, so perhaps you can just continue. Professor Maina? He has dropped again. Hello? Professor Maina, I'm saying you can continue. Uh, okay. Your yeah, net go is ahead, breaking. Go ahead. It's is my network okay now? Can I continue? I hope so. Go ahead. Oh, okay. One thing is to gain brand trust and give an example of Sidai. The, the metrics used to rate their performance and they got really good high performance. And I think this is an important concept when private sector is working in, in this extension service delivery, working with qualified, well-trained staff and working with a wider diversity of partners, either from the inputs of Hello, George, do you hear me? Professor. Mohammed, we, we moved on. We'll come back to you later if time allows. Oh, now okay, we are okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Go ahead, Professor. Now I'll, I'll, I'll mute it, right? Okay, mute, please. A presenter from Sidai is private sector needs to see the farmer as an employer. And when the farmer is doing well as an employer, the company, rather, as a private sector, will also do well. And the other thing is, the, when the private sector is participating in extension service and enabling the farmer, it, it's really more or less like contributing to baking a larger cake. It is good for everyone at the end of the day. The second presentation was from Josephine on, in, on Britain and their work in Tanzania, integrating farmers into agricultural value chains. One of the key lessons is that you cannot work on, on the side of the market of the value chain without working on the input side because you create an imbalance in the system. I think this is very important, a very important point there. And they are looking at the entire spectrum of actors, a very important approach to map out their challenges and then work together with everyone to identify solutions for the whole system, not just for a particular segment of the, of the chain. One of the things uh, Britain are doing is helping farmers and supporting them to develop more or less into, into business corporations, you know, in terms of how they plan and manage their, their businesses. Uh, a very important lesson there is that one size does not fit all. And so they have these different structured models of working with their uh, stakeholders and, and farmers. Of course, they have introduced innovations in warehouse management and, and, and others. The other presentation was on the village agent model in Uganda by Mr. John Ari. And their primary goal is buying, but they have a secondary function in supporting extension service. However, they are not um, very well motivated and they also may not have the technical knowledge to support extension. Professor, you are dropping again. Ah, yes, and this is really one of the highlights of this presentation. So uh, a very important thing is to also make when relationships in the value chain are more structured 
and formal, it is better for everyone. And, and therefore, this creates now seeing an opportunity for youth to enter into uh, private sector supported extension uh, through this uh, space which is occupied by the village agents. Uh, one of the other things is uh, farmer-led extension versus So, pharma, sorry, pharma led, uh, I'm sorry for that break. This farmer led concept of farmer led extension versus office led extension. One of the important things is that youth engagement will require private sector to increase investment in extension services. And therefore, they, they should not be seen as two separate things. Youth and private sector are, are really part of one system. And therefore, deliberate action is needed to remove also the perception of agriculture as a risky undertaking. Uh, finally, the last presentation was to be made by Jahir Oliver. We wish him well. Uh, I hope we just learned he was involved in an accident, but we thank Henry who made the presentation. And, and again, they are looking to transform the last mile in agriculture. And the gap they are addressing is really the low number of tractor and farm, farm machines. They are innovating by in installing monitoring devices on tractors, softwares for managing equipment operations, booking agents, and risking asset-based financing. And more participating in extension. Maybe you're still dropping again. Uh, am I now? Am I clear? You're but finalize. Yeah. So lastly, a few of the opportunities, I, some of the opportunities identified, certainly there is value to harness in agribusiness and in agricultural value chains, and that should be something to attract private sector participation. The other thing is that smallholders are, are really the majority. We have just been notified. They are really 80% or more. And the other thing, it is still cheaper to do extension through private sector. Uh, one of the things we, we learned, there is room to integrate uh, the extension function into this trading you know, function. Challenges, uh, training youth uh, should need to demonstrate value, otherwise they, they may not uh, you know, join and participate. We need to very well understand the needs of the private sector and, and bring them on board, make sure they are well uh, addressed. The informality in value chain value chains currently is not a good incentive for private sector engagement. Uh, some of the issues in supply chain integrity, in financing and insurance, and these were highlighted. Finally, opportunities for policy. Uh, one of them is to clearly realize that we cannot delink private sector from government roles. Uh, we, we need more evidence to support policy development. Uh, two issues raised, one is a fiscal policy there shouldn't be really a significant price evaluation and the role of private public partnerships uh, in the new Mina you're dropping again the policies uh, that have been developed and there is also the point of harmonizing the, the services and operations being provided by different uh, actors in this space. Thank you very much, George. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we had a challenge of you dropping off, going on and off, but uh, I think uh, all in all, I think we've gotten the gist of what you're trying to say. So we can maybe ask uh, Mohamud Meki, who was to make some comments before I, uh, Professor Maina came back to make his comments very, very briefly, or his contribution very, very briefly. Please half a minute, if possible, a small introduction and then your comment. Yeah, uh, my name is Mahmoud Awad Makki. I'm uh, the Director General of the Extension and uh, Knowledge Management in Agriculture Research Corporation, Sudan. And I would just like to reflect our experience in Sudan regarding uh, agricultural policies. And uh, I think we do have good agricultural policies, but they are not effective, especially for engaging the private sector. For example, 
we have uh, the Minister of Agriculture issuing a decree is dictating that every person who has a 1,000 uh, scheme must employ an extension uh, agent. But unfortunately, this is not effective. But now, when when we adopting when adopted the uh, uh, innovation platform, we are already engaging private sector in that value chain because value chain uh, uh, the IP we include all those players in the value chain, and there are some some private sector who are very keen, especially like the companies like uh, CTC, but most of their work is, is is concerning their 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 customers. Not everybody. They they do uh, extend extension services to those who are uh, 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 buy their products, like the machineries. What what, what do we call it uh, after sale uh, extension service? That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a valuable input uh, from Sudan. Uh, thank you very much for that input, uh, uh, Mickey. Right now, I think we move on to the next. Uh, uh, process in our timetables. I think that is the closing remarks. And uh, I am being informed that uh, we have a representative from the Ministry of Agriculture who will make the closing uh, remarks. I hope he's with us already. Yes, he's with us. Yes. I'm yet. Yes, is that? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Weekly, weekly. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, all participants, my name is Ucliff Amariati from the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock Fisheries and Cooperatives. I'm representing my director who is not with us here. And uh, in my final comments, I want to appreciate all the participants, the panelists and even presenters who have appreciated that there's a need to engage youth and private sector in agricultural extension and advisory services. Uh, it is true we need to engage the youth to participate in uh, these advisory services by involving them in the value chain segments that attract youth most. Uh, and I know this is where we have to use the use of ICT and mechanization. And uh, I know the private sector, they have raised concerns that they, they, they need to be involved during the policy making. And I'm sure that uh, the, the modern policy making process, it has to involve everything. In Kenya, there is something called public uh, participation and in public participation by law, we are required to involve everybody. So I know uh, also in our existing policies, you could be having some gaps, especially on the issues of uh, quality control. As much as we have so many private sectors we really need uh, private sector players. We really have to come up with a quality control whereby we have harmonized messages so that uh, to avoid uh, duplication and also uh, bombarding one farmer with the different approaches. So I know that is one of the areas that can be looked into. And I want to believe that the valuable contributions uh, given out by the the, all the panelists is going to inform a very good uh, policy briefs, which are going to influence the future direction of improved agriculture, agriculture and uh, uh, agriculture extension and advisory services. Mine is to appreciate the, the conveners, the organizers of this event. Thank you very much. And uh, I want uh, to even uh, request that uh, such fora should keep on, uh, we should keep on engaging so that we are able to improve the extension, uh, agriculture extension advisory services together. Thank you very much, God bless you. Thank you very much, Wycliffe. Uh, Henry, if you're still there, do you have any word to wrap up? Yeah, good. Thank you very much, uh, uh, everybody, all the participants. I think now this is the second, uh, it will be in a series of this webinar. Uh, initially, as they said, we had the arrangement, we had a plan to have this a one on one in February, in April, but then COVID happens. Therefore, we had once a uh, we semi webinar last the week before, then this week. Next week, uh, exactly the same, same day, same time, we'll have a uh, specific that will be talking about youth participation. We'll share with you more details as we, you know, the, as the week goes by on the, who the presenters will be and then the presentation. Uh, uh, secondly, 
It is also to assure all the participants that all the presentations that were made today and also the recording of this uh, webinar will be shared with you all. And so therefore, you'll be able to follow what, what, has, what, has, uh, what has gone on today. And also, please feel free to answer, to ask further uh, clarification in, in case of any presentation that, or that you need further clarification. Feel free to either direct to the, to the panel or even to ourselves, the, the, the organizers, and we will get back to you. Again, thank you very much. I look forward to meeting all of you and others next week. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you, for participation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Thank you all. Bye. 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 Bye.